Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska, everyone. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org, the world's largest and greatest live nature cam network. This is live footage of Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park, Alaska. It is Fat Bear Week 2022, so we're looking at some of the fattest bears in the world. And my co-host for today's play-by-play -play broadcast is Katmai National Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath. Chris it's getting a little brown at Katmai as far as the vegetation goes, but uh, still some beautiful fall colors there and some very rotund bears. There are. I was surprised to see it. Uh, I've been on a couple of times today and seen a few bears wandering around, but some beautiful orange colors and still some really nice fall foliage. This, again, is a live broadcast, and we're going to be talking about the bear activity that we see live on the webcam so we never really know what's going to happen uh, oftentimes you know there can be bears interacting we'll try to identify many of the individual bears that we see we also have different webcams available to us so not only the main brooks falls camera but we'll go to a bear's eye view of the river great view here of number 907 i think fishing on the top of brooks falls uh, 907 right now getting a lot of attention he is on the riffles camera as well this camera is located about 100 yards downstream of the Brooks Falls camera. And then we'll go to uh, an area near the river mouth occasionally uh, on your side of things. It's called the River Watch Cam. And there's a lot of bears fishing and scavenging for salmon in that location. This is about, as the water flows, maybe a half mile to three quarters of, of a mile downstream of Brooks Falls. It's a beautiful day in Katmai as far as like just the weather goes, just like a classic fall day, a little bit of termination dust up on, on uh, Mount Katolinat there, just a thin veil of snow marking the soon to return winter. Um, so we might be up on Dumpling Mountain every once in a while. To give you a better idea of where the webcams are located though, let's uh, take a quick tour. I know we might have some uh, new viewers tuning in today since it is fat bear week and a lot of people are thinking about Katmai's bears and Katmai National Park in Brooks River is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. Brooks River is pretty short. It's only about a mile and a half long, really no more than um, three kilometers. It's bisected by Brooks Falls and along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams on the river. The webcam signal is sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain. And then those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon about 30 miles away. It's quite a feat of technology to get the signal out of Brooks River, but I am uh, incredibly thankful that we're able to uh, share this experience in this amazing national park with everybody. Dumpling Mountain uh, camera is located on one of those radio repeaters that uh, hops and skips the signal out of uh, the park itself. Let's take a closer look at the latter half of Brooks River, the uh, the downstream half of Brooks River. Again, we'll be looking at the Brooks Falls camera, the Ruffles camera from time to time, and Riverwatch. The other cameras are offline at this time of the year. But even so, we still have a pretty good line of sight. Uh, the Brooks Falls camera focuses mostly on the falls area, but also the several hundred yards downstream from time to time. Riffle's camera looks uh, right in front of it and up to the falls. And then the lower river camera, or excuse me, the river watch camera is um, going to give us a really great perspective on much of the lower river. We're going to try to answer some of your questions that were submitted in advance. Thanks to everyone who's done that. Um, if you want to ask questions for any of our live events or are just curious to know what a ranger or myself thinks about certain things, you can drop those in the Ask Your Bear Camp question form. Look for the link for that in the partner tab on the left-hand side of the Bear Camp pages on explore.org or ask a moderator, especially if you're watching on YouTube, and download the Bears of Brooks River ebook. If you want to know more about the lives of the individual bears at the river, it's maybe the best um, first reference that you should have if you want to learn more about these amazing animals and can get that off of Katmai National Park's website. With all that being said, Chris, again, it is Fat Bear Week and uh, bears right now are what I would consider to be peak fat. Many of them may not get much bigger uh, before they head into their dens. Uh, and the bears are, are working to, to eat 
virtually any fish that they can find. They are what I've seen on the webcams recently is is the bears are not choosy. They are not, and they appear to be more than anything scavenging for the dead and dying fish that are still around, uh, more so downriver. And that's what this bear is doing right here. Um, so this bear is snorkeling, as we like to call it, just sticking its face in the water, looking for any salmon that can't swim away. There probably are spawning salmon very close to this bear uh, as it swims through the water. But, you know, bears are smart enough to realize that, you know, it's not energetically worthwhile to chase some of those livelier fish when you have other meals that are available to you. So this bear is looking in places that maybe it has found salmon before, the, the fish that have spawned and already died. And if you're not familiar with uh, salmon, they are anadromous. And that means they're born in freshwater, they go to the ocean to get big, and then they come back to freshwater to spawn. And they uh, die after spawning. So there's no returning to the ocean for salmon. And bears uh, will want to eat the freshest fish that they can find. But at this time of the year, there's not a lot of fresh fish left. There are still some spawning salmon in the river, but they're hard to catch. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if this is number 99 or not, Chris, but um, but this, if, if so, he's been sitting at the falls all day and maybe uh, taking a little walk, maybe not having as much success at the falls as he's, he's wanted. Yeah, I agree. Um, he hasn't been very, from what I've seen, I haven't seen him catch fish up there. So maybe he's deciding it's um, time to take a walk down river and see if there's anything laying around down there for him. We'll go down river real quick here because we do have, it uh, looks like maybe um, a mother, could be a mother and a cub on the far bank there. We'll just maybe get a brief glimpse before they move off into the forest and a couple of other bears sitting in the water in the foreground. The lower river area is probably the most productive fishing spot on Brooks River right now. Bears will still sit at the falls looking for some of the fresher salmon. Uh, but the lower river is definitely where it's at if you want a full stomach. And yeah, Chris, I do think that's a mother in her, and at least one cub. I don't. There could be other cubs hiding in the forest, but on that bank, um, walking away from us. And this is a time of the year that's, I think, interesting to watch the webcams because we often get bears showing up that you don't see in early summer. Maybe they're just not used to people. Maybe they don't like the noise and uh, you know the activity associated with camp, or maybe they just don't know to come to Brooks River in early summer, but sometimes you get a, a quite a few mystery bears moving through the area. Yeah, I can't identify too many of the ones I've seen. Um, I, I recognize 907, maybe 99. I've heard 504 and her two were in the river. So uh, I'm not, it's hard to tell from a distance who the other ones are. That mother bear, up in the upper left-hand side of the view. The cub, whoever it was, looked pretty big and, and fairly, fairly healthy. This time of the year, first-year cubs, they can weigh more than 70 pounds. Uh, we've had, we've, and we, we know that, uh, not because we've handled tranquilized cubs at Brooks River, but occasionally if a cub dies in the fall, uh, you know, we can pick it up and put it on a scale. And that's how, you know, we've I've, I've handled at least a couple of those when I was a ranger at Brooks River, just out of curiosity to see how much they weighed. And in early September, uh, some of them weighed like uh, more than 60 pounds. So you can sort of extrapolate, you know, going forward, if they're going to feed the rest of the month heavily on salmon and mother's milk, then they're going to weigh um, even more than that. And then second year cubs uh, at this time of the year, probably most of them weigh more than 200 pounds. I would say so. They've, uh, they've definitely gained some weight. Um, I was a little concerned about 94's little ones for a while, but they seem to be putting on some as well. Has anyone seen them at the river lately? Number 94 in her three spring cubs. I think they were seen yesterday, if I remember correctly. I failed to check the notes before our broadcast today. But yeah, I think they've still been around. And, you know, mother bears have to work a lot harder than the single bears because they are feeding themselves and getting fat for hibernation. But they're also, of course, looking out for the uh, welfare and growth of their cubs. 
these two bears here, Chris, that we're looking at look, um, you know, quite comfortable with one another. And a lot of times, you know, bears or people think of bears as these solitary creatures. They have that reputation of doing that. But we, we see a lot of social interactions between bears at Brooks River, and they're not always sort of social interactions that lead to conflict. A lot of times they're just friendly, friendly interactions. As you can tell when they're just wrestling around, no noise, that they're just interacting and playing. And uh, if they're sub-adults, this is how they learn to make their way in the world, just uh, just picking up some skills on how to wrestle and uh, when, when to just get out of the situation. Younger bears especially seem to enjoy a good, um, good play fight. And oftentimes they'll initiate play just like those two bears are doing, sort of like a slow approach. And then they'll, they'll reach towards each other with their muzzles, but a lot of times they just kind of jaw with one another. Uh, I think uh, Ranger Kim described it as sort of as a, as a bitey face. <laughs> You'll see bears threaten each other in a conflict situation with their teeth. They'll open their mouths up. They'll kind of growl at each other. Uh, but the, the, the body postures overall, a lot of times you need like maybe greater context, uh, but the movements and the body postures will be, I, I think, a bit more intense when they are fighting with one another or, or seeking to defend maybe um, a fishing spot, for instance. Back up at Brooks Falls, bear cruising through again, looking for salmon. This is their job at this time of the year. This is how they make a living. We'll still see them participate in other activities, but they're prioritizing eating over virtually everything else. And this is uh, an ad adaptation that drives them to put on the fat reserves necessary to survive winter hibernation. And that behavior really is, uh, it's a, it's a behavior that we can see, but it's also something that's something that they feel, an insatiable hunger that re they really can't satisfy at this time of the year. We talked a little bit about it during our, our live chat yesterday, Chris, but hyperphagia is one of these really important life stages for bears. It is. Um, so do you think the bears are still in hyperphagia at this point, or have they started to just uh, level out and trying to decide when they go into their dens. I bet they are. Of course, I, do, I, I don't know that for sure, um, but it's, it still seems fairly early enough in the, um, in the fall that they would be in hyperphagia. Of course, it's not like an on-off switch for them. They will, you know, go into it sort of slowly. They come out of it slow, sort of slowly. Um, and by, by the time they go into hibernation, they're really not feeling it. Their metabolism slows down considerably. Uh, their heart rate slows down, their body temperatures start to slow down. So what they feel right before they go into the den isn't that insatiable hunger um, compared to right now. Right now, that there's mechanisms, the hormones that make it, that your stomach uses to tell you maybe that you feel full, or um, you know, or or when you have a lot of body fat, the hormones released, you know, sort of as a part of that process that say, hey, maybe you you shouldn't have the appetite that you have those things are switched off um, at this time of the year for brown bears. So they, have, they feel this constant need to eat and eat and eat. About the only thing that they're doing that's not eating is resting. And if you look at the upper right corner there, Chris, a little bit of tree marking going on. That oh, really, it is. Yeah. Kind of get a vibe of that might be a one to eight grazer, but I'm not sure. The ears sure look like Females it. Do yeah, yeah, it kind of has the, the the right size and shape. Uh, of course, the bears are far far away um, in our from our perspective here. However, um, you know, grazer's a big girl, uh, and and female bears will mark trees. They don't do it nearly at the same frequency as as adult males do. Um, and there's not as much like tree marking behavior going on at this time of the year. It tends to happen much more during the mating season 
which is uh, which peaks in late spring. Bears might use that those marking behaviors if they're rubbing on a tree or clawing at a tree to uh, sort of advertise their presence in an area, especially during the mating season. Well, I see the blonde deers, but I don't see the uh, grazerettes with her. No, there's um. I don't think that's her because again, there's a there's a small cub oh. next to her. So again, the blonde ears oh, yeah. sort of threw me off there. Looks like maybe a first year cub. What would what, what do you think? Or a yearling? I, I think that's a first year cub. The yearlings. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Plump. Yeah, the the yearlings can be quite plump at this time of the year. Um, the spring cubs are like little balls of fat. The first year cubs. Um, Sometimes, sometimes the yearlings are, are exceptionally big, and you can you can almost confuse them with two and a half year olds because uh, they can't be so big at this time of the year. There's not that many mother bears with a single cub, however, uh, and there's not many mother bears with blonde ears. Um, Grazer has blonde ears, but she has two giant two and a half year olds, um, and this cub is definitely too small for that. Um, number nine zero nine has very blonde ears. She has a yearling, so. I guess I'm not necessarily willing to rule that out that it's 909, but um, her sister 910 looks a lot like her too. And she has a, a single spring cub and we've been seeing them wandering around the river quite a bit. They all look so different than they did. They're so much bigger now. They're darker. It's, it's kind of hard to tell them apart when you're not at the river, uh, at the river itself. Just a really nice calm day at, at Brooks River overall. Uh, with the bear action, raining. you know, kind of, no, it's not raining, which is, has been unusual for Katmai National Park at this time of the year. Uh, we're all summer, actually. But since it's, uh, you know, at a moment where the bear activity is, is um, kind of stable, let's uh, talk about a question here, Chris, because somebody was wondering... Uh, or wrote in for a student who was asking about how much the bears eat. So um, my students want to ask how many salmon do each of the junior and adult bears eat on average per day? So let's maybe start with um, the younger bears, those junior bears, um, you know, and we just finished Fat Bear Junior last week uh, with where we highlighted the lives of, of cubs. Uh, and it, you know, it varies a lot per cub, Chris, but you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, a, a spring cub, they, they just don't really have, you know, the stomach capacity that an older cub has. No, and the, the uh, spring cubs are going to depend more on their mom's milk at this point. They will uh, probably pick at the fish and learn uh, from mom how to handle them. But I think they're depending mostly um, on, on their moms for nutrition. Yeah, the digestive system of first year cubs at this time of the year is mature enough that they could survive without mother's milk, but mother's milk is still like a super important food for them. Uh, so they, they will be eating um, fish as they can. And sometimes they might, if they're lucky, they might scavenge one from a riverbank, but they're mostly looking for mother's scraps. So not a whole lot of fish those young cubs will be eating, but the two and a half year olds, they could be eating um, several uh, to many fish per day. I, I would not be surprised if like Grazer's uh, giant two and a half year olds, and we've been talking about her, but I haven't brought up um, a clip of those those bears to show you um, maybe the size difference, but this was just from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and they're almost as big as her. So they're gonna be eating many fish per day if they can. But the adults, you know, they, they go far beyond anything that a, a cub can eat. Um, Adult bears, males and females at the river at this time of the year can eat dozens of salmon per day. And the most fish that I have ever seen a bear eat is a 42 salmon in a sitting. And that was 480 Otis during a really good fishing day when he was <laughs> exceptionally hungry. We actually have a video about that event on um, explore.org's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can look for that memorable moment, Otis eats 42 salmon. That's incredible. I sat and watched 747 eat 32 at one sitting. 
which I thought was a lot. Sounds like uh, Otis beat him out on that one. 32 is a lot. <laughs> I, 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 you know, anytime I watch 747, it seems like he, you know, was taking so many breaks that he wasn't sitting there long enough maybe to eat 40 salmon. But I bet throughout the course of a day, he, eat, he can eat 40 fish when, the, when their fish are abundant in the water. Without a doubt, especially the ones that are sitting at the falls, expending very little energy, just waiting for the fish to swim by them. Um, they catch quite a few just uh, with the sit and wait technique. Somebody else was actually wondering, we were talking about hyperphasia just a moment ago, and somebody wrote in to ask about cubs and whether they are experiencing hyperphasia as as well. Um, so they wrote, I've noticed the cubs are playing less than they did earlier in the season. Are they also experiencing hyperphasia? And I think so. I think the cubs also are feeling that insatiable hunger right now. Hyperphasia basically means excessive eating, but for bears, it's not excessive. It's adaptive. Um, so I, th I think cubs probably feel that at this time of the year because only newborn cubs are nursing in the den. So they, they, the cubs that we see active on the river right now need to survive on uh, their fat reserves like, like mother. And Chris, uh, you know, the cubs at this time of the year also, from what I've observed, and maybe um, you can share some of your uh, insights on this too, but the cubs at this time of the year really do seem to be food focused, just like all the other bears. I, I agree. I think they're prioritizing food over fun at this point. Um, they've had all summer to, to, you know, goof around and, and learn how to fish. And at this point, um, they need to focus on eating as much as they can before they get into the den. So uh, between the hyperphasia and just the fact that even moms may be telling them uh, it's time to get down to work. So um, I think they're doing more more fishing than playing. Of course, the bears are, you know, doing well for themselves at this time of the year, looking, looking chubby, looking healthy, ready to survive hibernation quite well. When they're going into the dens, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't urinate, they don't defecate. Fat is the fuel that powers their wintertime survival. So every every ounce of fat that they can get, um, the better for them. Uh, a lot of times people do ask whether a bear can get too fat, and I don't think they can. <laughs> Uh, unless it couldn't walk, if it was so fat that it actually couldn't walk. But a wild brown bear, that's probably very, very unlikely to happen unless it sat on a, a continuous pile of donuts all summer. Because, you know, the bears at Brooks River, Chris, they have, in, in, in some senses, you know, um, ex, uh, access to an exceptional amount of food. And while we'll, we'll see bears with their bellies nearly dragging on the ground at this time of the year, it doesn't look like any of them ever get so fat that they couldn't walk. I don't think so, but have you seen 747 try to climb up that hill? It's He's getting close. <laughs> That's true. You know, some of, some of the terrain is a little bit harder for the bears to navigate than others. I also think that's one reason why the bears spend a lot of time in the water at this time of the year. It's just easier for them to support their body mass. They have pretty thick uh, and, you know, well-developed limb bones. So their arms, their legs, uh, really thick bones to help support their mass overall. But they tend to get overheated easily when they're moving around when they are because they are so big they're covered with a thick fur coat so if they're out of the water and they have to work hard they're going to get overheated uh, they don't have as far as i know sweat glands like people do they'll still lose heat through their um through their paw pads they'll still lose um, heat if they by panting if they need to but yeah staying in the water floating along is probably just a lot easier for them to, to navigate and of course that's where their um their primary food is right now I always wondered if maybe that was why Otis kind of worked his way down river in the fall where he could just pretty much, uh, it was much deeper and he could float more and still manage to get some of the dead and dying fish down there. I suspect that's the case. You know, o Otis, he's a veteran of, of the river um, in his er, uh, mid twenties, at least we'll see him moving down river from the falls frequently at this time of the year to scavenge um, dead and dying salmon. I think he just knows the tricks of the trade. So once it becomes uh, not productive for him to sit at Brooks Falls anymore, he'll just move on to a different location. And it could, he, you know, as an older bear, I'm sure he suffers from um, 
you know, probably ailments that a lot of old bears do as far as maybe even like things like arthritis or maybe just like, you know, old broken bones that have healed. They, they maybe just cause him pain if he had those in the past. And a lot of bears do have broken bones throughout the course of their lives. So yeah, being in the water like this uh, is, is probably just a, an easier mode of locomotion. It's got to be better on his joints just floating than sitting uh, on a rock. So uh, I think, and, and he's very good at fishing downriver. So uh, I do know I see him sometimes there in the spring, and but more often in the fall. Scar on the hip of this bear here, um, and a dark brown bear, sort of like a straight profile uh, for its face and muzzle when you see it at the side. And that uh, indicates to me that this eight could be one. number eight, eight, yeah, eight to one, Chris. That's what I was thinking. Eight to yeah. one is a bear that was raised along Brooks River, a young adult male right now. Um, and a lot of times these young adult males, maybe not eight to one necessarily, but a lot of them kind of like blend into the into the fold of bears. But then one day they like come back and all of a sudden they're acting super dominant um, and really big. Uh, so, you know, if A21 is kind of a happy-go-lucky guy right now, but with a lot of our um, adult males at the river, they were playful when they were younger and they're not when they're, when they're fully mature bears. So he's, he's definitely a bear to watch um, going forward. He's gotten quite large. Um, I was wondering if he would make the bracket. He didn't, but I think he would have been a pretty good candidate. Still got the bear hanging out in the back. Bears will patrol the riverbank too. They're not just in the water looking for salmon. So, um, they know that salmon sometimes occasionally get uh, swept to the sides. Uh, they get caught in the tree branches and the roots that are exposed along the river's edge. Or maybe this bear is just kind of waking up and <laughs> it's not quite you know, ready to commit to the water yet. I wonder if they can't see some of the fish better from above on, on the bank than they can if they're in the water. I bet I bet that's the case. And, and I think anybody who's ever sort of like walked, you know, on the edge of a lake and tried to see into the water, you know how difficult that can be with the glare coming off of the water. Uh, and then, you know, if you're on a bridge or you're on a pier or something like that, and you're looking straight down into the water, it's just so much easier. We can't underestimate how smart these bears are. They seem to be know their environment and know their way around it, especially when it comes to finding the last of the fish. We're about halfway through our broadcast today. So thanks to everyone who's tuning in, uh, watching and listening. This is live footage from Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. I, I'm joined today by my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger, Chris Kleesrath. We're talking bears and salmon and anything else that maybe catches our attention on the live webcams. We also have some clips, though, from the past uh, you know, week or more that we can talk about, too. We were talking about Otis, how he utilizes the lower river uh, frequently at this time of the year. Let's um, go to a clip that includes him, but this is taken from Brooks Falls looking downstream. And it's an interesting, I thought it was a slightly interesting clip because Otis really isn't showing any sort of interest in the bear families that he's swimming near, but the bear families are, are sort of on edge um, when he approaches. So this is uh, number 909 and her yearling up on the what the area we call the cut bank of, Brook, of Brooks River. This is downstream of Brooks Falls, a few hundred yards. They were resting, but they see a bear coming along. So standing up, alarmed, ears forward. So not feeling defensive yet, but still, um, you know, showing interest in whatever is coming in their direction. And at this point, you can't tell if there's a bear walking on the bank or if there's a bear in the water. But in just a moment or so, we'll see a submarine moving upstream. That's uh, number 480 Otis, 
in the water at lower right. Bit of a yawn there from 909, so that indicates tension in this situation. And then she rushes towards him and then gives a, you know, a few hops there. That's certainly a defensive reaction. And a bit of a surprise when I watched this too, Chris, because those bears, you know, they're not separated by a lot of linear distance, but uh, it would take Otis quite a bit of effort to climb up that hill, especially if he wanted to do it quickly. And his behavior in the water wasn't really showing or indicating to me that uh, he had any interest in the family on the top of the cup. I agree. It looks like he's pretty much just concentrating on finding some fish with his snorkeling technique. 909 is a tolerant bear of certain other bears, especially like her sister um, and her sister's cub. We have seen them associate with one another frequently this summer, and that's been really amazing to watch. But, you know, we don't really necessarily see her uh, hanging out with a lot of other bears, um, especially the adult males. She's going to give them space, even though Otis hasn't really been known to show uh, a lot of um, aggressive behavior towards bear families. But 909, maybe not taking any chances, or maybe she's just trying to display a little bit of dominance in that situation. And Otis, you know, in, it, in this instance, at least, really couldn't care less. I think if we let this clip play just a little bit longer, we'll, we'll see the camera pan upstream, and Otis will swim uh, closer to another bear family. He's kind of looking to his left because there's a, a bear family that was uh, sitting right on the edge of the water. Their reaction, though, is different than 909's. So they're coming into view right now, sitting upright, a, a cub giving a bit of a yawn, mom there giving a bit of a yawn. Don't quite see that mom's ears are pinned back on her head, maybe just a little bit. They're definitely not directed forward and then another yawn from her. So definitely she's a little tense in that situation, but didn't, you know, feel the need to, to charge Otis, which isn't always the case. You know, a male bear sometimes walking that close to a bear family, the, uh, the mother bear sometimes will engage uh, with, with the male just as a preemptive strike, so to speak. Yeah, and she, she seemed concerned, but not overly. She did kind of stand up to keep an eye on him, but not as much as our sister did. And right back to sleeping. So again, you know, that wasn't a situation that caused them, you know, an undue amount of stress. You know, when they lay, if they were really kind of agitated, uh, they might have left the area. They certainly wouldn't have left, laid down in that spot. So yeah, good. Um, you know, example of how, you know, mother bears might react to the approach of adult male. And sometimes it is, uh, you know, much more aggressive than that. Well, you know, they'll, they'll charge and they'll defend their cubs. Uh, but in this situation here, uh, paying attention and watching Otis carefully, but not maybe necessarily reacting beyond that. A21 here is still snorkeling upstream, looking for dead and dying salmon. So like the fact that he hasn't, we haven't seen him catch and eat a salmon in this area of the river, Chris, indicates to me that there's just not a whole lot of fish left right now. Because maybe like a week and a half ago, especially two weeks ago, uh, bears really couldn't walk through this area without finding like a salmon carcass. It must be pretty picked over at this point. Um days are get, definitely getting shorter up there and maybe they've spent a lot of time scavenging that area and there's just not much left. I showed this map last week during our play-by-play, -play, but I'll bring it up again. Um, this area or this map sort of shows the, the shaded areas, the, sh the areas that are shaded in gray solid gray. Those are areas where salmon carcasses tend to collect. The map isn't completely up to date. The, the lower portion of the river, the meanders have changed. So 
uh, it's it's not exactly what the bears are experiencing now, but any of those like eddies and side channels, shallow areas where the river loses its current, that's where the salmon carcasses drop, and that's where the bears are going to be uh, targeting in the lower river right now. So they know where the, to go to find fish, but as we continue to progress through October, it's just going to become harder and harder for the bears to find any salmon. And we haven't seen, you know, too many instances of a fairly empty Brooks Falls even over the course of the last few weeks. Bear moving on the top of the falls right now. But, um, yeah, since we're not seeing, you know, uh, bears hanging out successfully catching salmon at Brooks Falls, again, that indicates that there's not a lot of fish moving through the river. The migration for the salmon is essentially done. Any salmon that are left are going to be focused on um, finding that exact perfect fishing location, or excuse me, um, spawning location. We just haven't definitely seen any jumping uh, while we've been watching, or even when I watched earlier today. Um, I think that if they're spawning, it's downriver. I think they've given up and just decided to spawn down there. But I think it's, it's pretty much come to an end. Oh, had a little slip. And a bit of a blind lunge into that pool there. A lot of times we see bears uh, sort of like jumping and lunging through the far pool area. And they can't see into the water very well there. There's just too many bubbles, uh, especially when the water is high. But they know that fish sometimes congregate in those areas. So they'll just it's almost like a leap of faith. They're just kind of like lunging forward. Maybe I'll step on a fish that isn't aware uh, of my presence. You'll see that happening, of course, at this time of the year, but I see it maybe yeah. more often early in the summer when the bears are uh, especially desperate for like their first energy rich meals of the year. You can imagine what it would feel like, you know, to go only a few days without eating. Uh, you know, the bears, you know, after, you know, going months and months without eating um, any substantial meals, it must be just incredibly satisfying for them to get that first salmon meal in June and July. I agree, because when they do come out, they're very hungry, but the salmon aren't there yet. So they're depending on grasses and berries, and I'm sure that first salmon tastes extra good. Not water we have a question that's... Uh, go ahead. No, please. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, no, I was saying the water is still rushing uh, fast and heavy here. I, I wonder if he's having trouble keeping his spot. Right, yeah, just a little bit farther upstream from where he is sitting right now, where he was standing and sort of lunging before. The, the force of the water is pretty strong. I do not think I could stand there. I don't have the body mass of a bear. I don't have the four-wheel drive of a bear. I certainly don't have the cold tolerance uh, of, of a bear. So... They'll go, you know, where fishing conditions are easiest for them. Um, the water right in front of his face, though, is is really shallow. So if a salmon swims in front of him, um, he'll be able to see maybe the tail fin or the, the caudal fin. Um, that's the fin right on top of the back. It's maybe sticking out of the water there. So he's really well positioned to take advantage of, of salmon that's vulnerable in, in that spot. Well, uh, bear number, I think this is bear number 99, a young adult male fishing at the falls, just doing his thing. Let's go down river, just on the other side of the bridge. Uh, underneath, it looks like a bear family in silhouette. Lighting a little hard for me to tell just exactly who that might be, Chris. Do you have any, no, any uh, really educated guesses? Here. Okay. I, I think they look like springers. I don't know if you agree. Um, I don't think they're yearlings, but with two of them, it's hard to say. And thanks to our camera operators who are, you know, providing these views. Thank you for zooming in. <laughs> we have an army of volunteer camera operators, especially for the bear cams, but across explore.org that work really hard to um, provide these wonderful wildlife viewing experiences. 
you know, we don't thank them enough. So thanks for all of these really great views. Our bridge here, you know, interfering just a little bit with um, the view of the family. But again, yeah, this is a spot where bears know that salmon carcasses collect. It's fairly shallow there. There's not a lot of current. So any salmon that finish spawning and they just can't hold their ground farther upstream are going to drift down into that um, that cove uh, near the mouth of, of Brooks River, just on the downstream side of the bridge. And that is a popular place for families around this time of year. If there are any fish, there's quite a bit down there. Maybe we'll get a better look at that family in just a moment. Let's go back up to the falls here because we do have a bear actually eating a salmon. So this is Brooks Falls Low camera um, attached to the wildlife viewing platform where people can stand to watch bears. And maybe, maybe number 907 here. Hard to tell when he has his back turned to us um, munching on a, a fish. Could be a sockeye salmon, could be a coho salmon. Most of the bears are catching sockeye salmon at this time of the year, but there can be some fairly large coho salmon in the water and they arrive later than the sockeyes. So uh, they're fresher, they have more calories and they're larger on average. So they can be a big reward for a bear who's patient and skilled enough to catch them. So uh, we were talking earlier, Mike, about um, seems like the river had a special guest last week that the cam operators got a great picture of. That is true. And that we is. should definitely make a point to talk about that before we run out of time. This was uh, kind of an amazing thing that we saw. A lot of times people wonder, well, are there moose in the ever see moose? And it's not that common to see moose at this river. But the October is one of those months where it moves to move through. It's kind of the end of the wedding season for um, moose in the Katmai region. So they're just kind of moving around, or maybe it's still a little bit of the rut. And, um, you know, sometimes males kind of get kicked out of that situation by a more dominant bull moose. But just a, a really fantastic view of a moose moving through the river here. And the reaction of the bears too, Chris, uh, they, are, they are keyed in on this giant animal definitely backing it up now i don't know if it's the same one but we had a moose visitor last week uh was in the in the lake for a little bit and then down into the marsh we got some uh pretty good views of him and he was immense the moose in alaska are some of the largest in north america maybe the largest in north america they can weigh even more than the bears they're certainly taller. They can be seven feet at the shoulder. They're, uh, they have super long legs, so they're, they're good at dealing with deep snow. They're excellent swimmers. They're powerful runners. This is just, a, I think, just a great example of that. Uh, I don't, I'm not even sure a bear can run through the water that, that quickly, Chris. I don't think he can. Um, I think the long legs definitely give him an advantage. It was a bit amusing. He was swimming in the lake. He came out and started walking down the beach, uh, Neck Neck Beach, and was quickly followed by what appeared to be a sub-adult and then a rather large sow following him. Um, I believe he made his way through the campground and then back out through the marsh. So he did spend a little time in camp. And a bear at the end of that cliff, actually, let's restart this and uh, I think we have more to say about the moose. The bear at the end of that clip seemed like it um, was showing some interest too. Sometimes the bears are curious like that. They're like, hey, is that an injured animal? Is it something that, you know, maybe I want to want to feed on? Um, this family though, you know, the, the cobs backing up, um, they probably don't have a lot of experiences around moose. So you can see them backing up close to mom. Um, mom not showing overt alarm there, but certainly paying attention to the moose um, it, itself. Moose are such big, powerful animals that like a healthy moose isn't, doesn't really have to worry about a brown bear, but they, they like their space. So, you know, we're not going to see them congregating around Brooks River in large numbers. Just, I think because there are so many bears. We've seen, there were quite a few moose sightings out in the valley. I never did get one to see one myself, but um, a lot by some of the river crossings, um, more so than I'd heard about in years previous. So um, I was kind of, I was really thrilled to see him when he showed up. 
yeah, great sighting. Again, powerful animals. Looks like a fairly healthy guy. Got that um, that dewlap, that extra flap of skin. They developed that during the rutting season. Of course, those antlers help them to compete with other males for breeding opportunities. And here comes that bear at the very end. I think, again, you know, hearing a lot of splashing, things like that. Sometimes bears are curious about what's going on. Splashing sometimes indicates uh, the sound of food to, to a, a bear. Uh, not necessarily like, oh, hey, it's a moose, that sort of dinner bell. But it's more like, oh, hey, there could be salmon over there that are making some noise. Maybe I want to go investigate that. Or even an injured animal. You know, if they if it was thrashing or making some kind of sound like that, they might think it's something injured that they might be able to take advantage of. Absolutely. And many bears know that moose are food. Even if they're not like capturing and, and killing adult moose, some bears learn to hunt moose calves. Some bears uh, learn to feed on moose carcasses in the springtime. You know, you wake up out of the den, maybe you're lucky to find a winter killed moose and there's not another bear there. Uh, that could be a really big reward for you. This bear here, Chris, looks like a young independent bear, certainly not a bear that I would consider to be adult sized. Again, it, uh, you know, if the new viewers, you know, if you're wondering like, hey, how can you tell that's like a younger bear, you know, cause you don't have a frame of reference. It can be difficult at first. Um, so you kind of, you know, learn just by watching, um, you know, the overall size of the bears, maybe the way they carry them too. You know, a lot of times the, the sub-adult bears uh, behave in a, less confident manner than the adults, especially when they're around adult bears. But just overall, this bear looks to be smaller in frame than um, the, most of the bears we've been looking at today. Yeah, I have to agree. He's younger, uh, just the way he he's carrying himself. Um, you can tell he's not one of the bigger boars. He's very curious too. Getting a few mouthfuls of vegetation there. Younger bears can make a living much easier on vegetation than older bears, just because they're smaller overall. So, you know, uh, a big adult male can't eat and digest enough uh, grass or sedge uh, to gain weight. Um, it might give them, it's certainly giving them nutrition and some calories, but uh, over the long term, it wouldn't sustain like a really big bear like Otis or 747. Uh, but the younger bears, uh, the the newly weaned sub adult bears they can actually gain weight and sometimes even adult young adult females or um or smaller adult females can gain weight on vegetation uh just by or maybe being more specific vegetation like grass and sedge Earlier today, uh, you know, we were talking about, we had, a, we showed a clip of 909 and her reaction to 480 Otis as he uh, walked upstream. There's one more clip that involves 909 and another bear family. And this is an interesting, I think, clip to talk about, Chris, because this is a, an interaction that um, where both moms are a little bit nervous, but at the same time, it's, it's to me, what I see in this is that the cubs are driving the interaction. So I, we're, what we're looking at here is uh, bear 811 and one of her yeah, cubs of her on the right swimming towards the riverbank. Um, and that's where 909 is sitting. I think her yearling is up on the bank. 909 maybe, you know, it's just maybe looking to fish. I don't know. But the cubs, it seems curious and eventually gets close enough that it, it causes a a conflict between both mother bears. So again, second mom on the left there, cub in the middle, 909 on the right. 909 seeing the other mom approaching, turns around, tries to get up, stumbles. 
Mom approached, the other mother approached pretty quickly there, Chris, I think out of defensiveness, just because maybe, you know, she had some cubs on the bank there that she was looking to defend, even though, again, 909 wasn't really showing any interest in, in the cubs at all. Yeah, she definitely made a defensive move. 909 moved pretty quickly out of the way. But she must have sensed her agitation. And this isn't the end of the interaction either. What the 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 beginning of this interaction to me isn't the most interesting part. It's what ac actually happens after this, because the the cubs seem to realize, and these are first year cubs. They seem to, to I think they're first year cubs if I remember right. They um and they look to be of the right size. Uh, they sort of drive this interaction. They're not following mom back into the water. You see the cub running up there towards nine zero nine, the darker one. Yeah. Um, so sometimes cubs cause trouble for their mothers. And, you know, I think maybe every mother can anticipate that. And Chris, I know, or, or, or has experienced that. Chris, I know you're a mom. Um, so they probably <laughs> experienced that yourself. And then look at that cub again, just giving 909 a charge. Yeah, that's when you want to say, what are you thinking? Just come back over here where you belong, she's probably saying. And I think 909 here is kind of in a tough spot. Uh, she ends up turning around. That could uh, elicit a, a another defensive reaction from um, from the other mother bear. And I think we do see that a little bit uh, late, uh, just in a moment here on this clip. So she's trying to climb the bank. But yeah, here comes the other mother bear reacting defensively to the the attempted departure of 909. Still, she's not going too far, though. Cubs still Cubs showing still curiosity still there. Curious. Still sort of like driving this interaction between the two families. Walking up the hill, even. So, again, they're not kind of done. I, I think, you know, these are one of these situations where we sometimes see um, cubs kind of push these boundaries around other bears it's almost like they know that their mother is the bodyguard that's going to protect them in these situations so they're they they will test their boundaries um around other bears and sometimes people i've been standing on the wildlife viewing platforms like in late september and october and sometimes the the cubs will like show curiosity in the stairs or whatever thankfully it's usually pretty easy to, to dissuade um you know the cubs just by like maybe stomping on the deck just lightly and just saying hey no you don't want to do that. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, maybe I don't. Uh, but, yeah, they'll, they'll test their boundaries when they know mom has their back. Back to live footage here. We just have a few minutes left in our broadcast. But, of course, it is Fat Bear Week. We haven't talked about our Fat Bears in Fat Bear Week yet but i think this is maybe uh, a great opportunity to do so fapper we've already concluded fapper junior fapper week continues through october 11 and it's a uh a, a 12 bear tournament we've already eliminated two bears chris but there's um some real behemoths um and healthy bears in in uh, today's for, um, first round matchups it's been a tough one today uh, with 854 against 151, 909 against the Bat Bear Jr. champion, um, it, it can't be an easy choice for people. Uh, David has gained a tremendous amount of weight. She's looking really good. Uh, she's had a single summer to get ready. Uh, she's been seen courting, so I would, I'm, I'm partial to 854, so I'm going to say I'm, I'm hoping for some spring cubs uh, come springtime. That definitely could be in her future and you know that that picture of her the from august is you know doesn't i think encapsulate just how big she got by the end of september but it's difficult to get good photos of the bears uh, when they're at peak fat her competition 151 walker he is just a pair uh, so so big yeah, especially sure. on his yeah on this on those hind quarters the other matchup today however is um, between a young adult female and 909's uh, yearling. So that's 901. Um, you got a chance to watch her a lot this summer, Chris. 
what's um you know what's her disposition and personality like uh 901 um she's very to me very curious um she's not shy at all um she was pursued by many of the dominant males um she she has really truly gained a, a tremendous amount of weight you, you wouldn't even recognize her if you'd seen her in the spring um to now um she uh, she, she likes to make a little trouble in camp sometimes <laughs> she gets a little overly curious and uh and and likes to try to approach people sometimes but um for the most part i, I think she behaves pretty well and 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 she's gonna give uh, 909 junior a, a run for her money yeah, she's matched against nine zero nine's yearling, you know, who is a second second year cub, very uh, a large one. Again, probably two hundred plus pounds. Has a remarkable transformation. Young bears are not only putting on body fat for the winter time, but they're also eating to grow their frame to get taller and larger. So this um, this cub, uh, presuming that you know it it survives winter, which it looks quite likely to do. Uh, could be on its own uh, next year. We don't know that for sure. Um, her mother, 909, has never uh, had a litter of cubs before, so we're not sure if she's going to wean the yearling or uh, or next year, next spring, or keep uh, her offspring for another year. So that's a story to watch um, going forward. If you want to vote in Fapper Week, the polls are open today for another hour. So go to fatbearweek.org right now. And then we'll also have two other matchups tomorrow, Chris. And um, maybe we should preview those very quickly with the last couple of minutes remaining. The top match on Friday, or the first match, I should say, Bear 164, the upstart young adult who has a very unique fishing style versus 435 Holly. That's going to be a tough one. Holly's always been a fan favorite. She has definitely put on some weight. Again, newly single mom. She had two years of taking care of cubs. Now it's now it's just her job to make sure that she puts on enough weight to not only make it through the winter, but she's been seen courting several males as well. She could show up with cubs in the spring. So she needs a little extra weight in case she gives birth over the, over the winter to nurse them and uh, and take care of herself while she's while she's in the den. 164, he's popular also. Um, I think everyone likes him for his unique fishing styles. He's very innovative. Uh, just, uh, he's gained a tremendous amount of weight also. He's been very successful at his spot under the falls. So um, it's gonna be a tough competition. We have some people that are, admire his in, in, ingenuity. And of course you've got the great bear, uh, Holly, Four three five. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that one tomorrow. It certainly will be. Uh, I, I think this match could go either way. But you know, Holly has such a devoted fan base that you know, I, I would I would suspect if I were to put a wager on this things, and I don't. <laughs> just to be clear, uh, I, I think a four three five Holly might pull it out. But I don't know. You know, Fapper Week is unpredictable in that way, and it's one of the things that makes it really fun. Our last uh, matchup tomorrow uh, is between two giant bears on Brooks River. Bear 747 versus 32 uh, Chunk. And 747, I've said it many times, he is one of the largest brown bears in the world, the largest brown bear that I have ever seen a 1400 pound giant at this time of the year, he comes back to the river big and he just keeps getting bigger. So he's a tremendous animal, but his competition, Chris, is no small tyke. He is also, Chunk here, just a monster. Oh, he is immense. And and it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be hard for me tomorrow because these are two of my favorite bears. Uh, 747 and Chunk. Chunk was actually the first bear I ever saw at on the road when I got to Brooks. So he's a bit of a sentimental favorite for me. Plus his, to put it plainly, his behind is huge. But 747 showed up this year looking pretty beat up and a little skinny. Um, but he's definitely remedied that situation. His ears look better and he is, he is just immense. 
So uh, it's going to be hard for me to choose tomorrow. And I think uh, that a lot of people are going to run into that. For sure. Tough choices tomorrow. I think either one of those matches can go either way. I'm not really sure what's going to happen. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how the votes play out. If you want to vote in fatbearweek.org for the matchups that are ongoing right now, uh, go to, yeah, again, go to fatbearweek.org where you can vote. And then for the matches tomorrow, the, the polls open at 12, 12 noon, 12 p.m. Eastern time, and they close at 9 p.m. Eastern time. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for tuning in today, Chris. It's been a fun broadcast. You know, the bear activity is slowing down at Brooks River, but that's expected for this time of the year. But bears are still finding success as um, this, uh, this young bear is doing uh, right here. So, Chris, thanks again for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. And everybody, don't forget, you still have time to vote today if you haven't. And uh, I look forward to the matches tomorrow. That was Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath with Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for joining us today. And